I'm Claire Parker. And I'm Ashley Hamilton. And And this this is Celebrity Memoir Memoir Book Book Club. Club. The podcast where we are here slathering sunscreen onto celebrity memoirs so that no one is burned by the scorching hot amount of words. Instead, you just get a sweet little tan of ideas. Do you have that ready to go? Did you write that last night? (laughs) I was trying to think of something to say while we were starting, and I was like, oh, it's summertime, baby, and I've got a firecracker of an opening line. (laughs) That was great. Can you tell them who we are grateful for this week? Thank you to Dipsy for supporting Celebrity Memoir Book Club. Dipsy is an audio app full of short, sexy stories. If you're looking to heat things up, there's a story waiting for you. Get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash worm. Claire... Tell us a story from your week. If you were to write a memoir, what would last week's chapter be called? Rude Awakening for a Rude Little Girl. Uh Uh-oh, who's been rude? Me and you. Oh. Um, Not you, (laughs) you being anybody that's not me. Oh. As you guys might recall, I got engaged recently and I went into it thinking I was being like the coolest bride in America. Just chill, calm, collected, whatever, don't care. I had the whole thing planned. It was going to be very low-key, very just family-oriented, friends, easy, squeezy, lemon breezy. I went to start booking things because I knew that you had to put down a date quick as a wink. I've known exactly where I wanted the location to be since March, and I should have just executed pre-engagement, which I wanted to do, but I knew society looked down on me. And then I went to ask for the Saturday I wanted. And I was told that Saturday was booked. And then I said, well, what other Saturdays in June exist? And they're like, none. And I was like, well, what about May? And they're like, none, none then either. And I was like, well, wh- when can I get married? And the answer is, I guess, never. <laughs> I will say, we always have been like, why would anyone do a long engagement? What is that for? And I think we've found our answer. I'm a pretty impetuous person. So I was like, well, what about this September? I was like, what are you guys doing next weekend? I could plan this thing in a week. I don't care. We'll see. I think I might have to get like courthouse married in between just to give me something to get my yayas out on. What if we plan a trip to a water park? It's just like a fun thing to look forward to. <laughs> it's not scratching the right itch, but goddamn. So this is my message to the other brides of 2023. Stand down, bitches. <laughs> Most of you are going to get divorced anyway. So leave me in my June alone. I will say I did offer very kindly to go in and break up couples, but you didn't take me up on it. It's not that I didn't take you up on it. It's that I don't have the information. I can't send you out to every couple in New York City. Okay. Well, if we know any hackers who can get into the database of the restaurant Claire wants, let me know. Send me some info and I'll get to seducing. (laughs) Yeah. Nudes will be sent. (laughs) I will have the wedding date of my dreams. Ashley. Yes, Claire. If you were a celebrity and you were to write a memoir, what would you name last week's chapter? I would write um, Hot Dog. Everybody's got an opinion. (laughs) I am still relatively new to dog parenting. And I want to say my heart goes out to real parents because, my God, the amount of information out there that exists to ruin your fucking life is horrifying. I feel like having a dog during the summertime, the amount of TikToks I've seen that are like, listen, if you take your dog for a walk when it's sunny outside, you are effectively sentencing them. And I'm just like, to what? Like, why would you say that to me? I'm sorry, but I'm literally certain that dogs can be outside. And like, I know you have to be careful. I know you have to take care of them and watch out for signs. But literally I saw TikTok being like, so-and-so should have known better than to take their dog for a, a 10 minute walk while it was 70 degrees. And I was like, I'm sorry that your dog stays inside. All You sound crazy. You sound crazy, not me. But then they stress you out and it gets in your head. And I've talked to a couple of people who just like all say different things. And if you Google anything, Google will be like, listen, you should be literally murdered for even Googling this question. It's so stupid. You don't deserve a dog. And it really stresses me out. And, it, and I talked to the vet. I have called the vet like three times this week. And they've talked me down to be like, listen, you're doing a good job. Just use fucking common sense. And I'm like, yes, okay, sense. I've got it somewhere, but man, is it stressful? Here's the thing. When I first got Bug, I was really excited about her being a cute little puppy. And now I'm really excited to have had her for like a year so I can stop freaking out about everything and just like trust that we've experienced every turn of weather together. I believe in you and I think Bug will survive. Me too. If only to ruin my life forever. (laughs) She makes Claire insecure because Claire is not as funny. (laughs) Or no offense, as beautiful and kind hearted. (laughs) No one's as good as bug. I live in her shadow every day. It's hard. (laughs) Anyway, speaking of 
life in the shadows full of rules and terror. Should we get to this week's memoirist? You may know her from her Netflix series, My Unorthodox Life. You may know her as the creative director of La Perla. You may know her as the woman who designed Kendall Jenner's 2017 Met Gala look. Is that true? Mm Mm-hmm. I Googled it. But we know her as Talia Handler. (laughs) Or Julia Hart. We are doing Brazen by Julia Hart. Julia Hart was born April 11th, 1971. She is currently 51 years old. This book came out recently. The weird part is this book seems to end around 2017. It doesn't follow the next four years of her life. Also, she says she started writing it a while back. She says she started writing it in like 2017. So it leaves out the TV show when she takes over Elite Models, when she's the creative director of La Perla, and when she's married to the Italian billionaire Silvio Scaglia, I think. Sure. So it completely leaves out that entire marriage. Plus the divorce and her being dethroned as a creative director of Silvio's brand La Perla. I think this must have been like heading to the press as that was all coming out. Yeah, because that happened in February of this year, right? Yeah, and I think this book came out a couple weeks ago. This book came out in May, so that means it was probably already... At the printing press when her current world blew up. Man, she loves to start fresh. Good for her. (laughs) So uh, she actually has a very interesting background. She was born in Russia to a Jewish mother. She never talks about her dad. I don't know that her dad was actually Jewish. I guess he must have been. He must have been. But he was not religious Jewish because he was a big part of the Communist Party. He really believed in the Communist Party of Russia. Her mother was brilliant. Two PhDs. They called her Dr. Doctor. (laughs) They fell in love when they were 19 and 20. He, her father, had this really high up job in the Communist Party where he was supposed to go around the country and get people all worked up and excited about communism. And so they traveled around together and the country, I guess, was in such a bad shape that he completely became disillusioned. And the wife, who had always questioned communism, was able to be like, we have to get out of here. Communist reality was far from the utopia Karl Marx had promised. Who could have guessed? Not me. They end up trying to get out and they use their Jewish background as kind of a ticket out because there are a couple of groups that are helping Jewish people escape from communist Russia. So they're able to get sent to an internment camp in Rome where they then await their next placement. So when she was very young, she says her earliest memories are from Rome. They end up going to Austin. There was a small group of Jewish people who would sponsor you if you came to Austin and help you with rent and money for a year, which they honestly didn't need. They got there and they both her father and mother were employed at IBM right off the bat. They made like a good middle class lifestyle and they were able to buy a house, send her to private school. They both worked full time and her mother completed her second PhD in philosophy. Yes. Sorry. That's when she became doctor, doctor. (laughs) However, at the same time, because they were part of this Jewish community, her dad's great uncle was a rabbi, part of the Lubavitch group, which is really into proselytizing, which is actually rare in Judaism. They were really into taking irreligious Jews and turning them Orthodox. So as we saw in Sex and the City, in Judaism, you actually are not encouraged to convert and they don't do any sort of outreach into the non-Jewish community to encourage people to convert. And if you do want to convert, you actually have to go to a rabbi and get turned away three times before they'll even let you have the discussion. However, there is a group within the Jewish community that goes out and tries to get not religious Jews to become religious again. And that's the proselytizing that happens. So that's what happens to our family. It turns out her uncle is very high up in the Lubavitch community and he finds out that they moved to Austin and just descends on them like a Pekka vultures. So they get connected with the Shabbat, their local Shabbat. Chabad. Okay, sorry. sorry. It's okay. <laughs> so they get connected with their local Chabad and start becoming more and more religious. They start spending every Shabbat with them. And then when Julia's young, she's like eight or nine at this point. And to her, it's just like a fun Friday night hanging out with friends. So she's happy to do it. They do it for two years while her mother slowly gets more and more religious. And I do think it seems like it was her mother who was the driving force behind this. I mean, she says pretty specifically that her mom was looking for something to believe in. And when they were back in Russia, her mom had sort of started dabbling in exploring her Jewish heritage and she was a little bit interested in it and was underground exploring Judaism because in communism you weren't allowed to, but she was very interested. And then when this door opened up, she just got more and more into it and the rules just started piling on one by one over the course of several years. I also think to go from a country where everything is prescribed 
to the US and sort of have that entire framework taken away from you. She was looking for something to replace it. She obviously was super smart. She had studied philosophy. And I think it seems like she was almost burdened by the weight of ethics and choice. And yeah. this filled the void. Julia says, freedom is onerous and there are no guidelines. You're left floundering alone. Religion fixes that problem, especially ultra Orthodox Judaism. There's a rule for absolutely everything. Everything is fraught with purpose and meaning. Yes, you have to relinquish your freedom and control of your own life, but you are given something vast and powerful in return. Purpose, meaning, community, righteousness. And then she goes on to say the feeling of righteousness is the most powerful drug in the world. And I actually reading this book was thinking about something and I actually think strict organized religions are extremely similar to drug use in my opinion. I like really believe that. I think that there are some people who just like dabble on the weekends and it's kind of a vibe. Like they do Shabbos dinner, they do whatever they want to do. Just like the same way people just kind of like take drugs here and there. But then the further you get into it, the further it just controls every aspect of your life. And there are some people who like can't dabble. They have to be all in or all out. And it does result in like very dangerous lifestyles for some people. I think fundamentalist religions are extremely dangerous for the everyone. So I think it really takes a turning point when her mom decides that they're going to go full kosher with a full kosher kitchen, because at first it was like they did kosher in the house, but then it became, they couldn't eat kosher food out of the house. And then it became eating kosher can become so strict that essentially Julia was unable to have a life outside of her home because she had had friends from her school. She had had camp. She had had a separate life outside of her house. So it didn't really matter what her mom was doing at home. But when Julia had to keep kosher everywhere she went, it basically meant she couldn't eat or be with anybody that wasn't her parents. So this was Austin, Texas in the 70s. So finding a kosher place to eat outside of your home was just non-existent. They also didn't necessarily trust the other Jewish people in their community because it wasn't that strict. So they just wouldn't eat anywhere that wasn't their home. And then they just began to get slowly cut off from the outside world. The summer of my 10th birthday, my mother got pregnant. Before I was born, she'd been told that she would never be able to have children. And then she proved them all wrong when she got pregnant with me. Despite having eight miscarriages between me and my first sibling, she would eventually go on to have seven more children. So the days of being an only child were over big time. Her pregnancy happened when we started keeping a kosher home. So to her, it was further proof that God was pleased and that she was on the right path. They end up having two more children. And at this point, they are extremely religious and living in Austin. So then they decide at the end of her eighth grade year that she is too old to be going to a mixed school and they would be moving to Muncie, New York, a haven for ultra Orthodox religious Jews because they just didn't feel like their lifestyle could exist in Austin, Texas. And whereas they had been the strictest Orthodox Jews in Austin, they came to Muncie and it was like a whole level up and Throughout their life, her mother just continues to progress up the ladder. I yeah. mean, clearly she's an extremely like smart, dedicated person. And if you give her a goal, she's going to reach it. <laughs> if you tell her that these are the rules, she's going to do those rules the best anyone's ever done them. So Julie explains that there is in an ultra Orthodox community, there are a lot of hierarchy from where you come from. So people who were born into religious families are superior. It really is this level of righteousness that they apply to everything and can just be misconstrued in any direction. So where she moved to Muncie, she was from a family that she wasn't born into a religious family. They became religious during her lifetime. They weren't from like a religious lineage. So in Muncie, they were lower class. Yeah, her mom became a stay-at-home mom and her dad worked at IBM. And even that was really looked down upon because the highest goal for a man in this community was to study Torah all day. So if you had a job, it meant you weren't studying Torah. So she came... She was very looked down upon and judged by her peers and she was not accepted into the community because she was seen as less than. And this, obviously, she's an extremely driven person. We haven't even said it yet, but she's super smart. She's constantly testing higher than everybody. In Texas, she got some of the highest test scores in the state. Like she is an extremely smart, driven person. So when she came to Muncie, she decided to be the best Orthodox Jew so that everyone in the community would have to accept her. And she was constantly trying to prove herself and become the best to overcome her background. Yeah, she said, my father was employed at IBM in Westchester and I was so embarrassed and ashamed that he had a job. I was determined that my husband would be a rabbi and my children would never have to be ashamed of their father. In Muncie, she has a really hard time fitting in with the other girls in her school because she's new. And I mean, this is a community that grows up together. And then also she comes from a family that wasn't initially religious. So she just has a lot of catching up to do. She feels very behind and she always feels left out in every community she's ever been a part of. So initially she was like the Russian Jewish girl in Texas. Then she was the religious girl in her Jewish community. Now she's the not religious enough girl in her ultra religious community. And also 
in their building of this new life, her parents back burner her entirely. In this community, it's really impressive for women to consistently just have babies every year. Like that is your goal as a woman is to be making babies every year. And her mom just goes into overdrive getting pregnant as often as possible. And she essentially becomes the live-in housekeeper nanny. So when she's 13, she talks about how her parents forgot to throw her a bat mitzvah because they just really didn't even know it was her birthday. And when she reminded them, they just bought pizza and invited some kids over to the porch. And then she tells stories about completely raising her siblings, waking up at 5 a.m., having to do all of the laundry, go to school, come home, do all of the dishes, scrub the floors. She tells a story about... That night when Shabbos was over, I washed every single dish and there were a lot of them. Then came cleaning the floor, which was the thing I hated most. It was linoleum and everything stuck to it. Using a mop wasn't good enough. I had to get down on my hands and knees and wash it with a cloth. It was after 10 p.m. when I finished cleaning. And as I sat there on the floor, a feeling of happiness came over me. I felt accomplished and I had only just turned 12 and I had managed to get through the day without a single complaint to my parents and with a smile on my face. I felt quite sure that God was happy with me. Maybe God was happy with me, but my mother was not. And she says all she wanted was like a thank you. And she just never got it. Everything she did just raised the minimum of what she should be doing. Her mom actually came in and said, you missed a spot. Can't you ever do anything properly? She looked at me, daring me to cry. I thought to myself, anyone can truly hurt you, Julia. They can wound you and make you feel small and insignificant, but they cannot make you cry. Only you have the power to decide whether you cry. And so that became my motto, never let them see you cry. And you can really see her heart in here and become like a full on adult. And part of the indoctrination here is that the best thing you can do is never be annoying or be noticed. You should be making yourself as helpful and as visible as possible. She's constantly pushing herself to complain less, to ask for less, to speak less, to be noticed less, and to be more helpful. There are a lot of terms here that are sort of sins, like about modesty, essentially just about being seen. You just shouldn't be. What's the word for modesty? Sneeze and unsneeze. Yeah, so there's word sneeze, which is like a good modest woman, and it can be used to kind of control any behavior. It's obviously how you dress and it's how you behave, but it also is a woman, if you're a good singer, you shouldn't ever sing in a way that people can hear you because you don't want praise. It really is about keeping yourself as small and invisible as possible. For women only. So she talks a lot about how what they learn in school is essentially that they should be in service of the men in their life. That's all a woman should ever do. A woman's place is to make a man's life as easy as possible so that he can continue to study Torah and the various religious texts that Jewish people study. And that is what a proper relationship is. And so in high school, all they're really learning is like the bare minimum of secular topics so that the school has accreditation. Teachers aren't even qualified to teach those topics. They just have textbooks and kind of cover them. Mostly what they're learning is that the proper life is to serve a man. She's constantly afraid of getting in trouble at school because the principal carries such weight in their community and in their matchmaking. So when they turn 18 or 19, that's when they get married off. So if the principal doesn't like you and you're considered kind of a troublemaker, which can literally be anything, like anything that you do that's out of line of these rules, will affect your standing in the community in terms of matchmaking. And it could not even be you. It could be someone in your family. She tells a story about the principal coming in and screaming that a girl in the class was evil and never going to succeed and everything in their family was evil and she was bringing evil to all of her classmates because it turned out that her mom had had a TV. Yeah. So it was extremely strict. There's always a punishment around the corner. But she tells the story of when she's 16, there was five children under the age of six and her parents went on a two-week vacation. Her parents went to Israel. And she was put in charge of all five kids. And I think that's a lot of kids for any adult, let alone a teenager, let alone a teenager who didn't ask to have all these kids. And she says they all got a horrible stomach flu. So they just like left her for two weeks with $200 and she had to take care of five children who were like violently ill. And that was just expected of her. She nonstop raised those kids until the day she left the house. But she is constantly trying to become more and more religious. Like she does not rebuke it at all. She says in 10th grade, she became the holiest of anyone she knew. She like reached a height of righteousness that she couldn't even keep up herself in 11th grade. Every day before bed, she would write down all of her sins of the day so that on Yom Kippur, she wouldn't forget. I mean, she definitely is like an obsessive, driven, intense person. And she applied all of that perfectionism to her religion. And it served her well. She became very popular at school. She was beloved by the principal. And she was a model young woman in this community. 
Yeah, she also writes that even then in my most religious year, my love for fashion continued unabated. I taught myself how to sew, learning from books and the Vogue patterns I could buy from the fabric store. I didn't have a sewing machine as my parents couldn't comprehend why I cared so much about fashion and my appearance. So I taught myself how to make patterns and sew by hand. And so she would take patterns that she would find and make them snooze. I don't think I'm saying it right. It sounds good to me. Whatever. So she would take patterns from fashion magazines and alter them so that they had super, super high necks and much lower hemlines and throw that shit together. When she was around 16 years old, her dad quit his job at IBM because this is when the Berlin Wall came down and he figured he could make money in Russia because they were Russian and he had that connection. And I guess they made a ton, ton, ton of money, but it wasn't until after she had already left the fold. So we never get details about how insanely wealthy he became, but he went into the Russian oil business and like built a pipeline to bring oil from Russia to Switzerland. And then later he was doing oil business with entire countries. So I know he became very, very wealthy. But at this point, she says when she was 16, as soon as the wall went down, they brought her mom's parents over and they lived in her bedroom. She lived in the laundry room, slept on a cot. That was also her dad's workspace. But she said she was happy about it because having grandparents there meant she had to do less parenting. So in 11th grade, New York State required that all students take the PSAT. I didn't even know what the PSAT was. We weren't told about it because the school believed it wouldn't affect us as we would go on to get married or attend seminary and then get married. We were told on a Monday that the next day we would be taking a test required by the state and that was that. I didn't study for it and I got such a high score that I received a nice chunk of money from the government to be used for college. But that money would go toward my teacher's seminary in Israel, which was nothing like college. So basically, nobody, man or woman, really is encouraged to go to college. It's actually very looked down upon because it is entering into the secular world. Later, she talks about how one of her much younger brothers had like a medical trauma, which we'll get into later, and got so inspired by the doctors that he wanted to become a doctor. And the family spent years hammering into his head that becoming a doctor was not honorable. He should become a rabbi. And they just beat that dream out of his head. Nobody really goes to college, so there was no question. Instead, you either get married as soon as you graduate high school at 18, or you can do a one year like super study of the, not Torah, because women can't study the Torah, but I guess Torah adjacent studies in well, you, Israel. She can study the Torah, she just can't study the Talmud. There's like five major texts and women can study like two of them. Okay. But the rest of them are like too complicated because there's a saying in Judaism that women's minds are light and cannot handle the weight of complicated texts. <laughs> Which, can I say, my mind's a little light. Ashley. I like that. I don't want to read complicated texts. Ashley. I like having a light floaty head. Ashley, shut <laughs> up. We have a book reading podcast together. This isn't funny to me. It's fun. <laughs> When she's in high school, she meets a boy at a Shabbat dinner. So the only way you really ever mix with the opposite sex is when your families have each other over for dinner. So there was a guy who her parents were family friends and there was a boy her age named like Yichel and she loved him and they would always find these excuses to see each other. He would drop books off at their house or just wander. And then they started making these secret plans and they would meet, never touch. They would just meet and have picnics. They were just sure they were going to get married. She was so in love with him. They planned their futures together. And then one day another girl came up to Julia and was like, me and Yichel are together. I gave him a blow job. If you don't let him marry me, we're already too connected. There's nothing you can do about it. And she was so devastated. She says her heart was shattered. And like, that was kind of her only crush that she ever had and her only chance at marrying someone who she liked. <laughs> so then she goes to seminary where she for a year studies it very intensely. It's called BJJ, Beth Jacob Jerusalem. It's super hard to get into. They only accept 90 people. And she says it's the Harvard of seminaries. So she goes and she has two roommates. One is even more serious than her and the other is like a joke. And again, she feels very left out. A joke who got in on the wait list. Can you imagine humiliating? Devastating. She says, I tried to dedicate my life to God and all I prayed for was a good match with a God-fearing man who would dedicate himself to the study of Torah and become a great leader of the Jewish people. So at BJJ, she was completely cut off from the outside world. There wasn't any contact with anything. BJJ was run by an incredibly brilliant woman named Rebitson David. The very first day she came into the school, she told us, they say that in BJJ, we brainwash our girls. Well, whose brain doesn't need a little washing? I thought it was exactly correct. We were all such imperfect beings. Whose brain didn't need a little washing? Brainwashing in seminary was so perfectly orchestrated that I had never even realized how much I had changed. If I had been a goody-goody before, I was 20 steps beyond that now. I couldn't manage to stop loving clothes, but I did stop focusing on the physical and the earthly. I had one focus, one single-minded goal, to find and marry a righteous holy man who would be a great luminary in the Torah world and to help him and to take care of him and raise a family together. 
That was all I thought about and all I wanted. If I had ever wondered if the life of Rabbitson was for me, those doubts disappeared completely. I was willing to suffer physical and financial deprivation for the sake of heaven. By being the cleaning lady, the sexual vessel to my husband and the babysitter to my children, I would attain my place in heaven. So then she goes back to Muncie where she enters the matchmaking process. So the way that they do it is there are these matchmakers in town who take into account the word of the principal, the word of other leaders in the community, and then the family's financial situation comes into play. The family's lineage comes into play. There's all these factors when it comes to matching people up. And that's really all that has to do with it. So then they match you up. You send a couple profiles. The parents pick and choose who you're going to meet and you go on like a date and you get three dates. Basically the boy proposes and then you decide if you want to marry him. Yes. Each date is three hours. No more, no less. No more, no less. She says, you cannot imagine the questions I had to answer before I was allowed to date some of these guys. One example, what kind of bananas do you buy? If you said ready to eat and ripe bananas, then you were a person who liked spontaneous gratification. No good. If you said green bananas, then you were planning too far ahead and didn't have faith in God that he would provide you bananas when you wanted them. No good. The correct answer was slightly overripe bananas. That showed that you weren't spoiled and that you were careful with money as they're usually on sale and much cheaper. What if I don't buy bananas? Cause I don't like them that much. I'm never getting married. <laughs> I'm fucked. <laughs> She does such a good job in this book, I think, of explaining the high you get from being more righteous than someone else and like the way that it's really sold to you that like self-subjugation is an obsession. You know what I mean? To become obsessed with making yourself smaller and the way that you become grand is by being so small. Yeah. And how just everything she does, every question she has, every time she asks something that isn't considered proper within the community she still is like, oh, the fact that I even asked them at all is proof that I don't deserve to know what I'm talking about. Like, I don't deserve the answer to what I'm asking because I shouldn't have even had the question. She also explains that because as a woman, your whole life is about serving a man who's studying the Torah. If you don't have a husband and a child, you're literally nothing. You are like an abomination and you have no value and anything you can do will hurt your chances of getting married. And so any mistake will like ruin the rest of your life. She says a woman's path to righteousness is wholly through a man. She also just didn't know that you could live by yourself. Like that wasn't a thing that was done. She keeps explaining. She's like, imagine going up to a woman in the 18th century and saying, well, why don't you just get your own apartment? That is how it was. Like nobody even knew that that was a possibility. I didn't even know I was aware. And if she didn't marry a man, she would have to stay with her parents. And you guys know how miserable she was with her parents. They fully just used her to raise eight kids. So she was like, well, at least being with a man is better than staying here. Yeah. So women get married off between the ages of 18 and 21 and men start looking for wives between like 21 and 25. She says, if a man hits 27 and isn't married, everyone's kind of like, all right, dude, you got to get your shit together. But for a woman to hit 21 and be unmarried, you're just like, all right, she'll just live with her parents forever. That's done. And then once you get married, you're expected to have children immediately like yeah. that year. So you're just a baby having babies. Anyway, so back to her match. She gets set up with three different men before she says yes. The first one looks too much like a tele- tubby and no matter how much she likes him as a person, she's like, if he touched me, I'd puke. <laughs> So she says no, and her parents are furious. Yes. The next man comes from a super wealthy family, is cute enough and like laughs at her jokes, but she's so obsessed with having a man who will be like a great Jewish leader and a genius Talmudic researcher. And this guy goes to baseball games. Yeah. And she's like, I can't marry a man who's at baseball games. Like I'll never get to heaven. We'll have like dud children and he'll suck. So she says no to him. Her parents lose their goddamn mind. And they straight up are just like, listen, you've said no twice now. If you say no a third time, like you're dead to us you've blown all your vetoes. So then she meets this other guy named Yosef and she calls a friend who's like dad taught Yosef and her friend is like, he is probably too serious for you. And that is all the fire she needs to say yes to him. Cause she's like, that's what I want. Serious. If you think he's too serious for me, I'm the most serious bitch there is. No one's ever been more serious than me. Let's get it popping. So something interesting about Yosef is he had gone to Wharton. So he actually has a business degree and he clearly did not come from an Orthodox upbringing and he had been out and about in the world, just scooting and booting. Yeah. Probably wearing shorts and stuff. And maybe, (laughs) yeah. So he, like her, converted into this. So even though that makes him like lower value, she has been promised that he will be a great leader because he takes this dead seriously and she has no other options at this point. She does not like him because on their first date, he's rude to her and that he like leaves her at the front door and nobody is home and she's locked out of her house and he just like abandons her at the front door. And then she's like, that was so rude. And he was like, well, did you ever think about the fact that maybe I had to pee? <laughs> and she's like, did you ever think about the fact that maybe I had to pee? Her parents were like, it doesn't matter who has to pee. You have to get married. So they get married three months later and you're not really allowed to talk 
in between because they know that you'll realize you hate each other and want to get out of it. And they're like, so no contact. Just remember the good things about those three dates. And she says that all she wanted was for someone to have understood her trepidation. After that first date, she's like, if my mom had just said, it's actually fine, we'll we'll try one more match. She knew in the bottom of her heart that this is not what she wanted literally at all from the first moment. And she just couldn't do anything because when she said yes to the engagement, she's like, if you break an engagement, it's as good as getting divorced. Like you're just fucked. If you are somebody who has broken an engagement, you'll never have another husband and you'll have to live alone like a widow in your dad's basement. Yeah, what's basement? the word? They said like nebich. <laughs> yeah. Yikes. No one wants to be that. So she says yes. They get married. It's supposed to be the best day of her life, but it's like the worst day of her life. She's miserable the whole time. The dress, she's not even allowed to buy a new dress. She has to rent one that's like the ugliest dress she's ever seen. They put on green eyeshadow and then she's allergic to it. So the next day she wakes up with a swollen face. Wakes up with a swollen face. And the worst thing of all is that she's on her period. So in orthodox religion, you're not allowed to touch a woman who's on her period. And then she has to be clean, quote unquote, for seven days. And I didn't know this. The way that they prove you've been clean is you have to put like a tissue up your vag. And if it comes out, it can't have any color on it. But the problem is, as you guys know, there's like secretions and stuff. So sometimes there's like a non-blood color on it. But if there's anything, up, if there's a single color on the tissue, you have to like take it to a rabbi who he himself will determine whether or not it's clean and then you have to start at day one again if he decides it's not clean and then afterwards you have to do this special bath where you go and you have to be wholly naked and not have anything extraneous on your body and that means like any nail polish but also it means like fingernails that are too long it means if you have any dry skin that's like flaking off you have to peel all that off if you have a hair that like falls out of your own head and lands on your shoulder that can't be like nothing can be on your body they even check inside of your orifices to make sure Nothing is hanging out anywhere. It's like super invasive and then they dunk you in water three times and then you have to have sex with your husband that night. I wonder if that's exactly when you're fertile. I'm sure that has to do with like a fertility yeah, calendar. Yeah, because I guess, so when you're on your period, you can't have any physical contact with your husband at all. Like he can't even pass you a pepper shaker. Like in a lot of Orthodox households, they sleep in separate bedrooms or they have a separate bedroom for it or at least a cot for the woman to sleep on, of course, because when you're on your period, you can't sleep in your husband's bed and it's his fucking bed. You go to the mikvah, you get dunked, and then you come home. And so I guess it is almost two weeks after you started your period, which is when you'd be ovulating. Yeah, so very smart. I mean, honestly, because I was thinking, I was like, these women keep getting pregnant. Like, they're getting pregnant three weeks postpartum or whatever. And I'm like, how are they doing this? But I guess that mikvah thing makes sure you're always having sex, like, right on time. Since she's on her period on her wedding day, they don't even get to physically touch for a while. And then when they finally try to have sex, they li literally don't know how. The other weird thing about the mikvah thing is like it's absolutely shameful because of the implication that you'll have sex with your husband that night. So you have to do it fully in secret. Like not only were they not allowed to touch at the wedding, but they couldn't let anybody know they weren't touching because that would mean that like they were on to them that they would one day have sex. It seems like at a wedding the jig is up, but <laughs> yeah, so they had to fake it. And in the three months before the wedding, instead of talking to each other, they each were going to marriage classes. It's basically where you're taught how to be a good wife and where you're taught how to like subjugate your wife good, <laughs> depending yeah. on if you're the man or the woman. And she was told that when they had sex, she needed to keep her body holy so that if she got pregnant, the baby would come out with a fair shot at life. And they compare it to drugs. They're like, listen, if a woman does drugs when she's pregnant, that drugs will affect the baby's development. If you're not spiritually pure, you're going to have like a spiritually deformed baby. Yeah. So they were like, while he's boinking you, you have to recite Psalms so that if an egg gets fertilized, which obviously they would never say, they like didn't explain how babies are made. But basically, if you were to become pregnant from that sex, you want to have a baby that came to be during some Psalms. Don't enjoy it basically was what she was told that you should never enjoy it and you should never turn your husband on too much. And meanwhile, he had been told by his super strict rabbi not to engage in foreplay, not to make it enjoyable for her, that he shouldn't even be enjoying it. Nobody yeah. should enjoy it and he shouldn't feel too tempted by his wife and he shouldn't even be speaking to her. Because like the worst thing you could do is speak to another woman and the rabbi's like, and that starts at home. So if you get used to talking to your wife, who knows what other things you might say to a woman. You might see other women as people and talk to them too. Don't talk to her. Don't kiss her. Don't yeah. foreplay her. Don't enjoy it. So there's like the word of the Torah and then there's these stringencies that some people engage in to ensure that you don't do something that accidentally breaks the word of the Torah. And they come with every single situation. So like sex, food, clothes, everything. There's a separate backup that's like not even part of the Torah, but they're like, just so you don't accidentally fuck up that Torah thing, 
do this thing and said, so Yosef is told that he should not spend too much time in my company, that kissing and caressing me before the actual act was not only unnecessary, but sinful and harmful to his desire of being a great rabbi. Basically, sex can only be done as a mitzvah if you have the holiest and purest intentions and is not born from pleasure or desire. So she realizes pretty early on that she's like a touchy feely sexual person. So like when she is finally alone with him post mikvah, she tries to jump his Jewish bones and he is like, oh God, what do I do? And they can't figure out how to get it in. So she realized pretty quickly that marriage low key blows. Yeah. She says that they've kept trying to have sex and it wasn't working and they couldn't get her hymen broken. And finally she started bleeding. So they went to the doctor to see if her hymen was still intact. And the doctor told me that the blood was from the walls of my vagina, which were bleeding from the constant dry abrasion that I was suffering every time he entered me. It didn't occur to me to complain or ask to stop. It was both of our duties and we had to keep going until he managed to break my hymen. Let me be very, very clear here. None of this was Yosef's fault. The reality is we were both just doing what our teachers had told us. He had no intention to hurt me or cause me pain. And in all the years of our marriage, he was never physically abusive in any way. We both thought we had a duty and that to do it in any other way was to harm our children's souls in their very lives. We were so clueless and so sincere and so very wrong. She does throughout this book give a lot of credit to Yosef for... Not, it doesn't seem like he's a bad person. It's just they're from a culture that she finds very abusive. So they don't get along. She says it's not like they constantly fought. They just coexisted and did not agree with each other. He didn't really like anything about her. She was very outspoken. She didn't want to have to wear her wig when she slept. But apparently there's a rule that not even the walls of your house should see your nakedness. So he wanted her to keep it on the whole time. And he's like, everyone else's wife can keep it on the whole time. Why can't you? And she's like, well, the metal pins dig into my head and make it so I can't sleep. Yeah. And I also will say, I wonder how many people actually do keep it on 24 seven and how many people say they keep it on 24 seven to appear like righteous and holy within the community. Yeah. I was thinking that too. I was like, I don't, maybe they're lying. What would you tell the truth, Yosef? I'm honestly sure that everyone's lying. (laughs) So she didn't get pregnant for quite some time. She loved not having a baby. She did not want a baby at all because she had just come from raising her seven little siblings and she was like, I need a break. So they get an apartment in Flatbush. He's studying and she takes on two full-time jobs as a teacher in order to support them. So he's making $500 a month and she's making $65,000 a year because she's working two full-time jobs. And then on top of that, her parents help with the apartment because that's part of the Jewish tradition is that the bride's parents will support her and her new husband for as long as they have to. Yeah. And at this point, her dad's business was taking off, but they weren't like rich, rich yet. I mean, her and Yosef can't stop bickering. He brings his shul friends over all the time and she's always cooking and cleaning for them and then engaging them and making them laugh. And she likes to talk and he hates that. He's like, whenever I go to my friend's houses, their wives just sit quietly in the corner. And she's like, I did not wake up at five today. (laughs) Like to cook and clean and work two jobs so that I can do all this work to sit in the corner and like watch you guys have a good dinner. She says she was waking up at five and going to bed at 2 a.m. every day. That they didn't like each other at all and she was pretty unhappy, but at least she was working too hard to really notice it. So finally she gets pregnant with her first daughter, Batsheva. And it was like they had to. For her to go two years without having a baby, everybody felt bad for them. They said that every time she saw a woman, they would be like, I'm so sorry about you not being pregnant. And meanwhile, she was thrilled to not be pregnant. But when she had bought Sheva, she loved her so much. They were so happy. So they moved back to Muncie with the baby. She continues to work two jobs. And then she also gets a secret third job. She's selling life insurance because she sees at the Met life insurance. They'll train you even if you don't have a college degree. Yeah. And she decides that she needs to get like secret backup money. So for a little while, she ends up working at this life insurance company on top of all of her other stuff while having a baby. I literally don't understand how the schedule could have possibly worked in any way because she says she goes into work at the life insurance company, whatever. So she gets money from the life insurance company. She says that at the end of every week, there was always a reward for someone who hit the top sales goal and she got it every week. So she probably put away a few thousand dollars and just kind of sat on it for a just in case cushion. It was hard to admit, but the real problem was that I was miserably unhappy with Yosef. I didn't enjoy his company. I didn't want to be his wife. We didn't fight so much as coexist. I felt like I was always being judged and found wanting. I was never sneeze enough, just never appropriate enough. I talked back. I had opinions. I wasn't what he expected in a wife, and he kept trying to change me to fit the mold of the woman of valor he had wanted to marry. She wanted to divorce him, and she called her parents and said this. 
And her mom was like, does he hit you? And she was like, no, he doesn't hurt me physically in any way. And he's not mean or horrible. He just wants me to be someone I'm not. He wants me to be quiet and meek and obedient. And I can't do it. My mother looked at me and said, he is your husband who helps you by berating you. And he is doing his job, which is to make you into a better woman. Poor man. He's stuck with a woman who's too un... Unsnuis. Unsnuis. I don't know if that's right. You should be thanking Hashem for giving you such a wonderful husband. Love. Love is something made up by Goyim that only exists to draw you away from Hashem. Where does it say that Torah in the Torah that we are supposed to be happy? You are spoiled and selfish. Who says you need to be happy? Who says that's what you would deserve in life? Life is about serving Hashem. To live every moment of your life in pursuit of the afterlife. My God, just die already. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, she's writing about it, and I think she does a really good job of writing about it from a present day perspective, but like really letting you know how ingrained these rules were in her day to day life and how much she believed them. She writes about with her youngest daughter. They had a nanny because obviously she worked two to three full time jobs at a time. And she came home one day and found the nanny listening to secular music and wept and screamed and cried because she thought her daughter's soul had been tainted. Yeah, and fired the nanny. That's how extreme she was. She wasn't doing it because she's controlling. She was doing it because she like genuinely believed in her heart that this woman had hurt her daughter by playing this music. Meanwhile, she did not want to have the prescribed life of just having as many children as possible. She gets pregnant six months after Batsheva is born. And she has a miscarriage and she says they had to perform a DNC procedure, which was a terrible experience. But after that, I had an entire day to myself to recover. I was probably the most cheerful woman they'd ever met after a miscarriage. I still hadn't recovered from my first pregnancy and I just wasn't ready. I was 22 years old and I already felt like I was 50. My fears had come true. I looked in the mirror and the face staring back at me it reminded me of that poor woman in LA who was a woman she knew had been absolutely beaten down by having a child every year for like 12 straight years. She talks a lot about meeting a woman and being able to like see that she used to be vibrant and beautiful and the way their lifestyle just sucks it out. When Batsheva turned one, so when she was 21, 22, my parents really made it financially and so they decided to move out of the Smalley Drive home where I had grown up and build a McMansion of their very own in an affluent neighborhood of Monsey. We were barely scraping by financially, even with me working at the two schools and Yosef's Kalel stipend, the $500 a month. Kosher food is very expensive. So they move into their parents' old house. And basically he's like, what if I got a job? And they were like humiliated, but also they were sick of being broke. So she lets him go get a job as a trader. Because he has a Wharton degree. He was making $30,000 a year and leaving at 5 a.m. and not getting home till 10 p.m. So after the miscarriage, she gets pregnant again and has her second child, Shlomo. He's born extremely premature. And because his stomach is so tiny, she has to nurse him like every hour. Yeah, every 45 minutes, 24 hours a day for two years. For some reason, they nurse for two full years. So she talks to the rabbi and is like, kid, I get a TV. She's like, I'm so bored, breastfeeding literally all of the time. And he's like, well, I guess until your kid stops breastfeeding, you can watch TV. And because she has permission from the rabbi, they're allowed to get a TV. And they still keep it really on the down low in the community because watching TV is still super fucked up. And she literally only watches I Love Lucy and Leave It to Beaver. She's watching like 50s and 60s television. And she says this because they have the same dynamic as she does at home. Like the man goes out, the woman stays home. She says one time her husband came home and she was watching Leave It to Beaver and the couple kissed. And he was like, what the hell is this smut? <laughs> When Shlomo was eight years old, Yosef asked how I'd feel about leaving Monsi. He was considering a job at a company called Southern Energy, and it was in precisely the field he was interested in. He was earning so little, and the job would pay so much more, but the catch was it was based in Atlanta, Georgia. So they get the fuck out of town. So there's a thing called out-of-towners, which is like ultra-Orthodox Jews who live outside of the few super ultra-Orthodox Jew communities. And it's the exact same. They're just not in Muncie, basically. So they move to Atlanta where things are just a little bit more loosey-goosey, of course, because they have to be, because when you don't have an entire community and system like that, you're going to have to go to a Whole Foods. It's not as easy. So she goes, and for the first time in her life, she is a freaking star. She gets a job at one of the top Jewish girls' schools where she's teaching that's actually a normal school. Like, they have secular people teaching the secular classes, and she's there to teach the Hebrew classes. And it's her first time teaching Jewish classes in English. And also, don't forget that she's been teaching all this time without any sort of higher-level degree. All she has is the certificate from her one year at seminary. So she goes, and she loves it there because she has all this respect, and she's like the most Jewish woman in town, and everybody's really nice to her, and they're making a lot of money. And for the first time, she's not under the watchful, prying eye of Muncie. She can be a little bit more relaxed. And because of this, she ends up having her third child, Miriam. Mm-hmm. 
and she dials back on work and starts reading more. She's going to Barnes and Nobles every day and she's reading her secular books. She's watching more and more TV. She's like letting herself have a little fun. She even has like another major victory. So she talks to a rabbi because obviously there's been a lot of talk about the way she dresses because even though she dresses super snooze, she's still like very obsessed with fashion. And the rabbi basically says, especially in Atlanta where they're doing a lot of lubkoviching, I don't know, going out to less religious members of the community and sort of convincing them to become more religious because she looks so chic. They're like, it's actually good that you care about how you look because it makes people think that they can be super religious and not have to look like fucking dorks. And she's like, hell yeah, bitch. She's like lecturing less Jewish women about the Torah. And then those women bring their husbands. And now she gets special permission to actually lecture to men. And so she starts public speaking and she really likes it. One year, however, her parents come to visit and they are like kind of repulsed by her now. They're like, you are so modern. It's gross. And they decide to go to Disney World, which is just, I guess, a 10 hour drive from Atlanta. All of her siblings are 10 years younger than her. So her next oldest sibling is like 13. And then the next oldest boy is 12. And her parents are like, if we don't go to Disney World now, our son will be too old and it won't be appropriate for him to see women in shorts anymore. So this could be our one chance. I guess it's her dad's idea. Like the mom didn't want to go, but the dad wanted to go. So they come down to visit them in Atlanta and then they drive out to Disney World and their daughter, Batsheva, is definitively not invited. Because she's esteemed as too evil and unpure. To like spend time in the car with the fam. She's four years old. Unfortunately, on their way back from Disney... They get into a car accident and I don't really understand what happens. One of the seats like dislodges from the van and falls out and one of their sons is killed. Yeah, he's four years old and he passes away and the child next to him, the six-year-old, in an attempt to save him, I guess, grab him, had his arm ripped up and so he had to spend an entire month in the hospital. It is in times of travail that our community really shines. Give them a crisis and everyone is there pitching in and helping in a thousand little ways. The entire community gathered around my family. There were always people during the Shiva sitting with my mother just holding her hand. There were people who cooked and others who made sure the house was clean. I remember being so touched when I saw Yankel, the CEO of a very successful company with a mop in hand washing my parents' floor. It was one of the most beautiful aspects of the world that I come from, their compassion and caring for one another. I have to agree with that. Jewish people do grief like nobody else. It's top tier. Because the mom is just inconsolable with grief, she decides to that there has to be like purpose behind this and becomes even more religious. I think Yehuda's passing was the death knell to any sense of religious balance for my mother. The only way that she could manage to live through the unthinkable was to believe that there was a meaning and a purpose behind Yehuda's death. Some of our neighbors told her that a child, when taken so young, is often an old soul who had to come back down to earth to make up for some horrendous sin in a previous lifetime, and that when the soul was cleansed on this earth, they died, and their soul went back up to heaven purified. The Rav told her that it was a very strong and special people who merit being the parents of these recycled souls, and that it was because of Hashem knew my mother was so holy and pure that he gave her Yehuda for a few short years until his task on this earth was completed. So they become even more religious. So they start imposing the stringencies, like these even further rules that really ensure that you don't accidentally break a rule from the Torah. The example she gives is that bugs are technically not kosher, but like if there's a bug in fruit that you don't know is there. Like if it's microscopic. In the Orthodox community, the determination is if your eye cannot see the bug, it's okay. Right. So like the bug is still not kosher, but you, there's no way of knowing that it was there. So you're like, fine. They're like, no. If there's a bug in any of our produce, that is making our bodies not kosher, which then like blocks the spirituality from their being. And so they stop eating fruit and vegetables. I don't know how they ate. Yeah, you just start limiting everything. Anyway, so after she has Miriam, she has like a breakdown in the hospital and she starts crying and crying. And because they were in Atlanta where there was no Orthodox OBGYN, she actually had a Christian doctor who saw her weeping and was like, what is your deal? And she was like, I don't want to have more babies. And he was like, oh, easy. Just don't. Yeah, he's like, why don't you just go on birth control? And she's like, what are you talking about? The way that he said it's so a matter of fact, I guess in their religion, once you have one daughter and one son, that's considered enough. So she had fulfilled her promise to have one of each. So she secretly gets birth control and doesn't get pregnant for another five years. Yeah, so she's secretly taking birth control after having three children and people in their community, she says that she knew that that wasn't enough. She's like, I knew eventually I'd have to get off birth control because apparently under six kids, they're just like, what is wrong with her? And like Julia Hart, if you look at photos of her, you're just like, how could she even have one baby? She is the tiniest. She became so physically ill with every baby because her little frame 
would like double in size every time she had a baby. Yeah, she was constantly having horribly painful pregnancies and births. But even Yosef, I guess because he came from a not super religious background and he had gone to Wharton and now he was back in working in the secular world. In Atlanta, they both kind of let their guard down. They're watching TV. Yosef and I even started going to drive-in movie theaters. I remember the first movie theater we saw together, Men in Black. We loved it and we didn't feel too guilty. We were still separate from the Goyim. I turned 30 in Atlanta and hinted that I wanted a real party, maybe even a surprise party. But in the end, it was no surprise at all. And I ended up cooking for it and cleaning the house for it and ordering pizza. My 30th birthday was just like all the rest. I was still too friendly, too outgoing, too open with the men for Yosef. My clothes were still too tight. My anger with him grew, although I kept it all bottled up. We never raised our voices in front of the children. I didn't want their childhoods marred by screaming parents. I was going to appear to be happy no matter what. But unfortunately, they have to leave Atlanta. So they go back to Muncie and they get a house kind of on the edge of town so that there's some privacy and they begin to like re-enter Muncie society. When they moved to Atlanta, they made a promise to themselves that they would only move for like three or so years because they knew if they raised their children for too long as out-of-towners, when it came time to match make for their kids, that would put them at a disadvantage, which everything is like for the matchmaking, especially with these daughters. Like you never get to sit and live your life. No. <laughs> it's all about what comes next. I mean, I guess it keeps you too busy to really think about it. That was her whole thing for a while. So a lot of the time when she wasn't thinking about leaving, it was because she was just too busy and too exhausted from child rearing and cleaning and cooking and everything and then still working to think. <laughs> so they go back and they send their son Shlomo to the same fundamentalist school that my brother Shlomo, who was six months younger than my daughter Batsheva, attended. All the kids go back to these schools and she says they've gotten even more fundamentalist and strict than when she was a kid. She says Shlomo was a very kind kid and had a hard time and that the teachers were really hard on him because he was from out of town so he didn't know as much as everybody else. And she said one of the things about these schools is that the teachers are allowed to hit the kids. One of Shlomo's friends had permanent hearing loss because of how hard he got hit in the ear one time. And the one thing Julia drew the line at is she went into that school and said, if you ever touch my child, I will go to the Goyim police and I will have you arrested for child abuse. So they never touched Shlomo. So they lied about having TV. Oh yeah, she kept the TV. She loved it. And she got a little, she got more and more daring with what she watched on it. It wasn't just Leave it to Beaver and I Love Lucy anymore. She was like watching TV. And she said Batsheva, because she had grown up so much in Atlanta, when she went to the school, she was popular and well-liked and was able to just tune most of it out. And it didn't really affect her. Miriam, the third child, on the other hand, was six and young and did not understand and would not accept it. She had a lot of questions. She wanted to play sports so badly and she like didn't understand why the boys were allowed to play sports and she wasn't, even if she was separate from the boys. She's like, if no boys are around watching us play sports, why can't we play sports? And this was like a crack in the foundation for Julia because she was like, listen, I had all of these questions but I was flawed. In my soul, I was a problem because I should have just been able to be pure and a good Jew. But my daughter, you like could not convince me that she was flawed. So if she had these questions, they must be valid. Exactly. I wanted to scream. That makes no sense. Why is it her problem if some guy stares at her? Why is my life so small? Because it's my responsibility that, to ensure that no man strays in his mind. I'd been asking myself these questions all my life, but I had always, always assumed that I was somehow flawed and broken. For the first time in my life, I decided to give myself permission to question. So this is when things start to crack. And she also has her fourth baby, Erin. Yes. So finally she goes off birth control and she has another baby because people are starting to look at her funny, like her baby maker is broken, which it literally is. Like she doesn't have healthy pregnancies. And she has two friends in town who are similar to her. They're not as extreme as her, but they're also like interested in knowing what the secular world is about, although they don't actually stray in their real lives. They don't want to join it. But they don't like judge her and act like she's a full on psycho for having any question. And they like to do fun things. Like they'll go camping or they'll go like tubing. They swim. They have fun. She wants to do normal things with their kids and she has a couple moms in tow that'll help her. Her big thing is having as much fun as possible within the letter of the law. So she's like, I was doing all this shit and none of it was breaking any single rule of the Torah. Like I was doing fine. And then a huge change comes. She goes on a trip with her husband to Las Vegas because he has to go to some convention there. And she's alone in the hotel room. She decides to watch a little TV and what should pop on but Sex in the City. And it's the episode where Samantha has the rabbit, the vibrator. Julia is so taken aback by the show that she downloads all of it and watches the entire thing. And because she's in Vegas and she is like not being heavily watched especially by the community, but her husband's at meetings and stuff. So she goes to a sex shop in Vegas and is like, give me one of those rabbits. 
She says, the first few times I tried it, I peed myself. The idea that I could please myself, that it was in my power to give myself this much joy felt like a brand new kind of freedom. Speaking of giving yourself some joy... When you feel like switching things up, baby, it is time to switch them up. Whether you like jamming out to country music one day and then going into throwback jams the next, whether your go-to dessert is creme brulee and then every now and then you're like, no, carrot cake, okay? You're allowed to pick your pleasure when and where you want it. And Dipsy has something for everybody. Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women because women know what women like. They bring scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and characters, no matter who you're into or what turns you on. There is new content every single week. So in between listening to your favorite stories again and again, there is always something new to explore. And Dipsy has sleep stories, wellness sessions, and basically everything you need for pleasure and comfort in every aspect of your life. It's your go-to place to spice up your me time, explore your fantasies, or heat things up with a partner. Maybe listening to a little sexy tale in the background is exactly what you guys need to spice things up. For listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash worm. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash worm. That's dipsystories.com slash worm. Can I honestly say I think Julia Hart would love this? Anyway, so she discovered the rabbit and orgasm. So she's home and she is more miserable than ever. Why couldn't I just be happy with my life? My misery was growing by leaps and bounds. Why wasn't it enough to look at the outside world from faraway lens? What was it I wanted? Batsheva was in high school now at her alma mater. I hated that she was going there. The fundamentalist views had only become more extreme. I wanted to send her to a slightly more modern school, which still was anti-college, but at least slightly less fundamentalist. But she adamantly advocated for bias Yakov because all her friends were going there. Also, going there to the number one school was just really important for the marriage matches. I had a guy that she really liked. And they had crushes on each other for years. And they ended up getting married right at 18. Batsheva didn't even want to go to seminary. She just wanted to get married right away. Yeah, it seemed like she was kind of vibing in the community. Like, it wasn't ideal, but she was just kind of chilling. Miriam, on the other hand, hated it. And she was getting called a lesbian at school. She didn't even know what that was. And also, she's bisexual now. They were, like, not wrong. (laughs) But like Miriam wanted to play sports and kept questioning things. And a breaking point was that Miriam got an F on one of her tests because she had used the word pregnant in it. And apparently it was considered unacceptable. It was like a swear word. To say the word pregnant. And she goes, that sentence negated all her hard work and her beautiful story. It was okay to be pregnant, just not okay to say pregnant. Excuse me, what? So we are supposed to get pregnant at 18, 19 years old. That's totally appropriate. And be pregnant every year until we hit menopause. But the word pregnant, that's bad. And she's got a point. I mean, that is so fucked up. So she is becoming more and more miserable in her life. She cannot take it much longer. So she decides that the only way out is to kill herself. She is so miserable that she can't take it anymore. She doesn't know what else to do. But the problem is if she commits suicide, that'll hurt all of her children's lives. Not just, of course, in her absence, but it'll hurt their standing in the community. And they'll have bad matches. And again, the name of the game is marry the best you can marry. Right. So in order to kill herself, she's like, it cannot be an obvious suicide. Because if she just dies, like no harm, no foul. But if she is known to have killed herself, then none of her kids will be able to get good matches. So she decides to starve herself to death. I could starve myself to death. I was always thin, so it wouldn't take much. 15, 20 pounds would finish the job. So she starts doing this. And at the same time, Batsheva decides to get married. Yeah. So she's in her little dating ritual and they bring her this man who's like a top member of the community and they're like oh this will be a perfect match and Batsheva already has a boy that she loves so she's like no and Julia is told that she should force Batsheva to marry this guy she's like it's your duty as a mother to force her to continue going out with him so Batsheva is begging to marry this guy that she likes and Julia doesn't want her to marry anyone she's like please just take a year go to college do anything just buy yourself some time but they keep begging and finally Julia is like, I will give you my blessing if you sign a contract that says you will not have children for five years. And this goes against their religion, but Julia figures out a loophole that's like, sign a contract and if you meet God and he says you have sinned because you didn't have kids, you can show him that I forced you to and that I pulled the rank of, there's another law that says you're not allowed to disobey your parents. She gets about Sheva to go on birth control because she's like, listen, I get it. They're young and they're horny. And she's like, I remember the way I was longing to be touched when I was 18 years old. And she already had this boy that she really loved that was a good match for her. So like, 
So they get married and she's like, okay, after they're married, then I'll do it. Then I'll finally end it because Batsheva will be taken care of. Then Hurricane Sandy strikes. You remember that? Yeah. And for some reason, her and her friend decide to go to this fancy kosher restaurant in Manhattan. She has this group of friends. And as I said, they're all more explorative like her. So they're going into Manhattan. They're leaving their specific little neighborhood. They're going into Brooklyn. And they're going to go out in the middle of the storm. And another one of their friend is like, hey, we're going to that restaurant too. Can you bring us gas? Because there's no gas in Manhattan. And they're like, totally. The friend doesn't get permission to actually leave town that night. Her husband is like, no, it's too dangerous. You can't post Sandy, go to a restaurant. But Julia goes anyway. She doesn't tell her husband she's going alone. Yeah. And she tells her husband that the reason she has to go into Manhattan is because her friend ran out of gas there. And she's like, it's a mitzvah to bring my friend gas. She doesn't say that she just like wants to go out to eat. So she goes, she brings the gas and her friend's like, all right, we'll come to dinner. And she doesn't want to be like, no, she's wearing ugly clothes. She like just ran out of the house and they keep insisting. So they finally come to dinner and a man is there. And this man is named Ephraim. And this changes everything. Her and Ephraim, they're talking all night long, all night long. And he has also studied philosophy. He's also read a ton of secular books. They're questioning each other. They're going back and forth. It's like they're the only two people at the dinner table. He's kind of uggo. But Julia is just so happy to have somebody listen to her and ask her questions for like the first time in her life. And at the end of the dinner, he asks her one final question. It's what do you do? And she says, I actually just applied to this training program at Sotheby's because I can sell anything. And she had gotten accepted but I would love to design shoes. She was so honored that he was like, what do you do? Cause she's like, oh my God, I seemed so modern that he just thought I had a job. And then he also asked, what do you want? And that's when she was like, I want to design shoes. And she had never been asked what she wanted before in her entire life. And so then he calls her the next day. He gets her number from the friend and is like, I work for a clothing company and we want to invest in a shoe company. Do you want to be our shoe designer? And so she's like, absolutely. So she comes, she like lies to her husband about what she's doing. She says she has a lunch meeting. She goes in the next day. She meets the team and she is the designer. It's a handshake deal. He's going to pay her like $100,000. And the thing about the Hasidic community is everything's a handshake deal. So she does not learn about contracts for like many, many years. So two weeks later, she gets a call. She's so fucking excited. And he's like, listen, the deal fell through. No, no shoot We're not buying anymore. But he's like, why don't I just support your brand. Why don't you come up with a brand? So he gets her a WeWork and they start working on this brand together. And I will say from here on out, it's about to get so freaking confusing. I feel like a great, I'm not calling her a liar, but you know, when you're like trying to trick somebody and lie, you give as many details as possible. This story, it could be told in one minute or it could be told in two hours. It's just like, and then this, and then that, and then this, and then that. it's a lot, a lot of details. So we're going to do our best to kind of get you through what you need to know. So basically with this opportunity, she low-key leaves Yosef and it's not a hard and fast break. They break up, but they kind of come to an agreement that he's not going to ask about her business. They are broken up, but like she's going to come back every single weekend to do Shabbos at home. And then also to the community, they're still going to like act together. And the way it looks to their community is she just like is a shut-in who had a mental breakdown. And everybody in town is like, oh, she's... She'll be back, but she's just having a nervous break. (laughs) Yeah. So then she is launching this shoe line with Ephraim, who then puts the moves on her. And then she's like, you can go fuck yourself. And then she starts working with his business partner, Samuel. So she thought Samuel was just some hanger on her. But then it turns out he was the one with all the money anyway. So they cut out Ephraim and Samuel is like, listen, I won't ever make a move on you. I respect you. I'll be the CFO. I'll let you do whatever you want. I'm just going to send you a ton of money. And I cannot even begin to explain to you how much money. I thought at some point the foot was going to drop that like there was no money. But in the course of the next two to three years, she spends bazillions. What's the exact number do you think? Four bazillion? I mean, to be honest, like to give them real numbers, I would say she spends close to two million dollars in like two years to build this brand. Is bazillion not a real number? (laughs) Anyway, so then she starts lying about her age to make it in the fashion world. She says that she, instead of saying that she's 42, she says she's 35. And she says that her 19-year-old daughter is her sister, which she says is like very believable because she is so young looking because her skin has not seen sun since she was like 12 years old. She like goes into multiple paragraphs about how, how young She looks. And supple her skin is. How no one would have ever, ever, ever guessed her age. Anyway, so she's working out of this WeWork. She's meeting people and she's meeting people who keep introducing her to people. She really does like a fake it till you make it thing where she just like acts extremely rich and 
then people think she's really rich. So she gets invited to super rich people thing. She is an Anna Delvey, Elizabeth Holmes. She really is Anna Delvey meets Elizabeth Holmes because she is selling a product that does not exist a la Elizabeth Holmes. And she is acting rich, even though she has like $4,000 So basically what happens is I guess she's tiny. She is beautiful. And I do think she's obviously incredibly smart. Yeah. I do believe that she is. Those PSAT scores, baby. But I do think like, obviously she made it to the top of the secular world too. Like, you know what I mean? She did just keep making it. And so obviously she is like an exceptional person and she's deeply confident. But I also think she has this incredible naivete that does draw a lot of people to her. Like, I feel like she is a man's fantasy in that she's like this sexy, tiny little pseudo version sex freak. I mean, she loves sex. But then also she does have that inherent innocence of she doesn't know how the world works. So if anything you say, she believes you. And I think that makes a lot of people feel good. If you are a man and here's this woman who is really smart and really confident and can hold her own is impressive, but then also reflects back to you that everything you know is incredible you're going to want to work with her or like be around her. I mean, and it works 50% of the time. Everything works out. She's on an airplane to Vegas. She meets a man whose job is shoe production. He introduces her. Like, you know what I mean? She just keeps meeting people. And I can't even get into everyone she meets. The other thing is because she has like unlimited funds coming in, she is able to seem already successful. So she's going to Paris for the first time and, and staying at the Four Seasons in Paris. She's staying at like, the Ritz Carlton. She's staying at the top hotels everywhere she goes and not just like staying in a room. She's renting out suites that cost thousands of dollars a night to use as her own showcase. So she decides that Paris Fashion Week a couple months after she officially left is the most important time for her to launch Julia Hart collection. Yeah. Which this is where I get really lost in the sauce. So she has this shoe production house that she doesn't fully trust. She has, the money is coming in, but it's unstable. Like she does not have a consistent stream of income. She has a supposed consistent stream of income, but she's not paying bills on time. All the bills are being forwarded. She's like a rich girl with a trust fund whose dad is going to Venmo you back later. So she has this guy, Samuel, who's obviously in love with her who mostly is using her as like a confidant. Like he's texting her nonstop emotional things, complaints about his wife, questions of philosophy, lapses in faith. And if she doesn't answer him, he gets mad at her. Meanwhile, she has, she meets this woman. Her name is Amira. And basically her deal is she was like a Saudi billionaire. She went to the Switzerland boarding school with like other children of billionaires, which is like a real thing. So she knows everybody and like the highest, highest, highest echelon of the world. Her dad died. And because she was a woman, she couldn't inherit anything. And her mom couldn't inherit anything. So everything went to the dad's brother who cut them off immediately. So she is like this former billionaire rich woman who is super connected, but has no cash. Right. But so when Julia meets her, she has no idea that this woman has no cash. She just is like, oh, there's this like rich woman who's offering to introduce me to other hugely rich people. So then they become friends and they start talking and she starts bringing Julia to the exact parties that she promises she can bring her to, but also asking for a fuck ton of money. She's constantly being like, hey, can you wire me 500 bucks? Yeah, can you go get cash right now and give it to me? And she's doing drugs all the time, but she does like the second time they hang out, she brings her to Dolce & Gabbana's private dinner party. She is legitimately introducing her to like the children of billionaires. And Julia is selling nonstop. And so everywhere she goes, I guess she is an incredible salesperson. All of that MetLife training. Oh yeah. So her big thing with her shoe line is that she wants to make super high heels that are like made out of non-traditional materials and are genuinely comfortable. So she's like, all we need to do is change the way the arch of a high heel is shaped to like redistribute the way your body rests on it. And then it won't be uncomfortable to wear five inch heels anymore. And I believe in that concept but like what is she a physicist how does she just like know from her drawings that that would work she keeps on insisting that this is her plan and all she needs to do is get someone to design the shoes that she's drawn but like why would that work (laughs) so in the book she says she got a patent in 2016 for cloud nine if you look on wikipedia it seems like she did team with a german engineering company that does ski boots Okay. And had done the gel insoles for NASA. So she didn't know, but it does seem like she went to a company that knew how to make comfortable shoes and said, how can we make these comfortable shoes chic? Yeah, years after. <laughs> I just can't imagine this is the first person who said, let's make shoes comfortable. Listen, you guys have, I'm going to put the shoes up on our Instagram. They look fuggly. I don't know if it's just because they're so dated at this point, because this would have been, no, this would have been like six or seven years ago. Yeah. This was like 2012. She left the ultra-Orthodox community 
We're talking about 2014, 2013. I don't know. To my eye, they look f- ugly. They're not something I personally would wear. We'll have you guys vote on the Instagram. So she's constantly running into situations where, like, when Ephraim, his investment becomes wonky when he tries to hit on her she's like get away from me and he's like i'll pull my investment and she's like fucking go so it keeps on happening where men will still assume control over her and then she will freak out which i get so she spends the next two years going to paris going to milan going to fashion weeks running back like she meets somebody who has a friend who will get in, her in touch with the head editor at Nas. so she has a meeting with them they're gonna buy 200 shoes then she's in tokyo and then she's in the shoes didn't come through she had these neighbors at the we work they convinced her that it was better to get your boxes made in india and she's like now i know because of tariffs and mailing and everything it would have been cheaper to do it in Italy, but by the time they came from India, they were all squashed and she still expected payment and everybody's always taking advantage of her. But meanwhile, she is constantly selling and it's always like someone just asked for $3 million worth of shoes, but Samuel's pulling funding. And then I met this person who introduced me to this person. I mean, the names of the people she's meeting, at one point she's in Khan. Lady Gaga has a pair of her shoes on and Jason Statham is trying to dance with her. It's a hundred pages of, and then I met this person and then that person introduced me to this person and then this person won $400 and then this person didn't. The most important thing that was constantly happening is that the shoes that she was selling didn't actually exist. And like, this is something that she never flat out says the most important thing is to get her shoe samples finished in time for that very first Paris fashion week right that's like her number one goal so she gets the samples in just in time but like the shoes are shit she's she puts one on and it snaps immediately and she's like okay hopefully people just like look and don't touch and then I'll like find a different factory but up till two years later like at one point Miranda Lambert wears a pair of her cowboy boots on an interview and as she's walking off the interview stage which is what eight feet that heel breaks so like she's constantly up against the fact that her actual shoes fucking suck and she's selling to people this like dream of a perfectly comfortable five inch heel that can't support human weight it yeah and it does not exist like she keeps on insisting that her designs are perfect but the factories themselves like cannot make it happen so she goes to this first factory which is a connection she got from that guy on the plane that she met and then she can't get into another factory because her orders aren't big enough but it's like until she's a big enough order she i don't know it's it really does seem like so she left the hasidic community in 2013 by 2016 she's the creative director of la perla And in that time, I don't know that there was ever a mass delivery of Julia Hart shoes to anyone. So like after the initial fashion week, she ends up getting a buy of 250 shoes from Harrods that she does not deliver on. She writes a letter to the buyer and is like, listen, my shoes just came in from the factory. They are not a quality that I could send to you. Please give me another chance when I can get my shoes produced in a new factory. So that first run sells nothing. The second season of shoes I don't understand really what happened there. They had a huge party, but like, I don't know that anyone bought shoes. And then, I mean, these parties are like at the Shangri-La Paris hotel, the whole thing was her shoe party. Like I just, the amount of money that is being- Aloe Black performed. And and no shoes have been sold. And it's like, she's falling in love with this 30 year old man named Lucas, who was like the son of a billionaire, but the family lost all their money, but he's still so handsome. And- And then he becomes hugely controlling as well. And that becomes like a whole other hiccup that she's dealing with Lucas. Amira is extorting her. Calling her up and being like, I need $500 right now. And she'll be like, get Samuel's number. And then Samuel's like, I'm not sending you the money. And then Amira will be like, I'm canceling every order. I'm going to call everybody and tell them that you're a fake and a phony and that your shoes break. And then people are canceling orders and then reordering things. And then Samuel tries to hit on her. And he's like, all I want is a kiss from you. Why won't you give me a kiss? And she's like, get the literal fuck away from me. So then he sabotages the whole company and it, basically goes under but then she gets a meeting with the guy from La Perla who's expanding it to be a full fashion brand instead of just a lingerie brand and they need a new shoe designer and so she brings her shoes and the guy won't even give her five minutes to talk and she just doesn't know what to do but luckily all the women in the company come and look at the shoes and are so impressed and try them on and so they end up going out to dinner he's like you know everyone was saying how comfortable your shoes are and so they bring her on and she's like the head of La Perla and because she's getting this job she goes back to New York because she had $3 million of shoe orders that she needed to fulfill. Samuel pulls all of his bidding because she has been seen with this billionaire son, Lucas, but she thinks she can leverage the La Perla deal to go get more funding. She gets 
$5 million promised in funding by this guy, again, over a handshake, who is sending it to her in like $4,000 increments. Like bags of cash. And then meanwhile, throughout all of this, throughout like the two years that she left the community, she's also like slowly shedding each little rule. Like, so she's going through when she first starts showing her arms and then she puts on pants and then she finally takes off her wig last. And then the last thing she does is eat bacon. But her thing is everyone's always trying to extort her and control her and take advantage of her, which they are. But also she's like, who is paying the millions of dollars for her to be staying at a $5,000 a night suite in Paris? Yeah, so my big question. She's flying first class to Japan, to Paris, to Italy, to Tokyo. Like, it's crazy. My big questions, I would say overall, are number one, why did she have to launch a brand this quickly? Like, I do think she keeps getting taken advantage of because she has no idea how business works, how fashion works, how any of this shit works. And that's why she keeps getting stepped on is because she doesn't know what she's doing. And so the fact that all of this needed to be done by that first fashion week, like, of course, she was just going to pay tens of thousands of dollars out the nose for a shit product because she, it takes ages to produce something that's good. You need to like do rounds of samples. That's not how this works to just be like, all right, I have this drawing, make it a perfect shoe in a month. That's not what, that's not what anything works. So like, why did it all have to happen so quickly? That makes no sense to me. I also do think this isn't a woman who like knows how things work. That's true. And also people were constantly offering, you know what I mean? If you went out to dinner one time in a storm and somebody was like, Hey, you want to be the creative designer? I do think her idea of what was possible at the gate was very high. She didn't know enough to self-doubt. I guess she didn't know enough to self-doubt, but it is this thing of like, she wasn't just trying to leave the community. She has like such a all or nothing threshold of being that she was like, listen, I'm either going to be the number one Jew in my community. And since that's clearly not working, I'm going to be the number one fashion designer of the world. (laughs) Here's what I have to say to that. I think there's two things there because I agree that she has such a capitalist mentality of like, now I like was going to win or being orthodox and I'm going to win being a capitalist. One, to me, it really mirrors her mother's thinking, which is like her mom was like, communism doesn't work. So what is a system that works? And it's like when your brain has been taught that there is an all encompassing system that is black and white, it's going to search for that. Like if you lose one, it creates a vacuum and it's hard to then find a world of like nuance and half measures. You have to fill it with something as intense as what left. And so she found a whole new mentality of becoming like the greatest businesswoman. That's one. And then two is I do think the type of woman who is able to leave a community like that is going to be an exceptional like and a powerhouse. Person. Yeah. Like a regular person doesn't leave everybody she knows. Like, so right now, none of her siblings and parents talk to her. I mean, she's lost almost everything. To be able to leave a community like that means that you have a drive that is kind of exceptional. I mean, and she understands it completely. She's like, if they want to get matches for marriage, they can't be in contact with their like mental breakdown, crazy aunt. Yeah, she seems very like understanding. Also, the men that were supporting her with these two Hasidic men, who were non-believers but had stayed Hasidic for like the business deals, she says. So in that way, she also had the support of people who were living very vicariously through her. Completely. And then I think what's really interesting, first of all, it was this like all or nothing mentality. And then the other thing is the way that she talks constantly about the people taking advantage of her. Like Amira was this situation where she would constantly cut her off and then be like, but then she would offer to introduce me to someone even bigger, even more important. So then I had to take her back. She does have this inability to admit the the mutual benefit of these relationships. She does talk so much about how Amira was like a drug addict who was using her constantly. But then the reason she kept Amira in her life was for the contacts. Like she doesn't have really the ability to admit to herself that she's also using people. Yeah, no, 100%. Samuel, her business person, who she kept getting chances to because he was providing money. Millions of dollars. She kept saying it was her loyalty and her kindness. And I think she needs to think that, but it's just obviously not. So I do think she's like smart and driven and incredible. But I also think it's really interesting reading this book and seeing the ways that she like cannot not be the hero of her own story. I read somewhere that she thinks of herself as like the Jewish Kris Jenner. And I'm just like, damn, she absolutely is. I mean, I do think that she did what it took. And I also do think she sees herself 
as deeply talented like an artist. And she says a couple of times that fashion is wearable art. She just has decided it's going to be her and she knows she has it. So it ends with she gets this La Perla deal and like within a year she goes from designing the shoes to designing the handbags to becoming the, the creative designer of the brand. And then she talks about meeting the head of the entire company that owns La Perla. His name is Silvio Scaglia. Yeah. And he's an Italian billionaire and they meet in Japan and she ends up being the co-head of Elite World Models and then the book just ends. And something that's interesting to know is as of February, they are divorced. They married in 2019. They divorced in 2022. And the same day she filed for divorce, she was fired from that job. And also she has now been accused of skimming money off the top. So, I mean, I do wonder what sort of first their relationship or her job at La Perla. It's one thing about her is that men love her. So another big criticism that I was seeing is the way that she paints the Orthodox community in this book and in her show. And I actually think she's like shockingly fair to the people she knows in the community. And what she dislikes is like Orthodox Judaism itself. Yeah. Cause she would have been modern Orthodox and been happy with that. And I really believe she could be. I like don't believe Orthodox Judaism is bad. I do think all extreme fundamentalist religions are dangerous. And the fact that this is a community where they like do not let the women get an education, a community without choice is obviously a problem. And to say that there's choice in a community where you like cannot have education or access to money, where's the choice then? I mean, overall, I have to say, I don't know if it was a great book, but it was deeply interesting plot wise. I didn't feel it was super important to quote her a ton. I don't know that her voice was very important in it, but I think it is really interesting to watch the journey of an incredible woman who, I mean, to start out as a refugee immigrant, to end up in Austin in a very anti-Semitic community, and then become orthodox and then leave that and then go to the height of the fashion world. I mean, she was on yachts and stuff. She in her life has seen more edges than most people ever will. And I do think she is very understanding and fair in this book. I think she like comes at everybody in her life with a lot of compassion and love and understanding of why they got to where they are, what she's had to do to like un brainwash herself. She's still proudly Jewish. She still believes in a higher power. She's very open to everybody's religion, but she thinks the fundamentalism in any direction is bad. And she just wants like women to have a choice and she wants her children and daughters to feel like they have control over their own lives. And I'm sure she's intense to know. And yeah, God, I saw like one headline that was like, all of her former employees are absolutely traumatized. And I believe it. I wouldn't want to work. The woman who was working two full-time teacher jobs and cooking. I mean, she seems like the woman who's getting three hours a night to like cook proper dinner for her husband. I mean, I think she is an intense, intense person. I mean, the model she came after her mom being like, listen, I am this level. And if you can't hit my level, you're a fucking idiot. And so like for her to take that to the working world, like, of course she's like that. No, I mean, and I do think she actually had training and being super disciplined. If, if one, if anything, if anything, she learned to discipline <laughs> and striving to be better. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. You guys this week on the Patreon. Oh, this week we just had a worm to the wise. So if you're looking for a little dose of advice and friendship, we're out there. And then also on the pod- Patreon this week, we will be, we will be talking about this TV show and whatever other TV show you guys ask us to talk about. We'll do anything you guys yeah. want. We love you. <laughs> yeah, we love you guys. And we love the most our five star reviewers. Valerie831. Um, you look gorge underneath that Val. Laquaba. I will see you down at the lake. Natalie123456. KK80 heart. I heart you right back. A Hans, Thank you for these, for lending us a Hans. AO dead cat check. AO. Um, sorry about your cat. <laughs> okay. That's all for this week. I love you guys a lot. And, uh, thanks so much.